You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. In my youth, my brother and I had a favorite spot in an upper field of my father's farm, from which we were accustomed, after spotting the first symptoms of a coming storm, to watch the operations of the contending winds, the sudden gusts and whirlwinds, the sidling swallows excitedly seeking shelter, the swift and swifter, black and blacker clouds, ever rising higher and pushing their angry fronts toward us. As we listened, we heard the low rumbling from afar. As the storm came nearer, the woods bent forward and shook fiercely their thick branches. The lightning zigzagged in flashes, and the deep-based thunder echoed more loudly, till there was scarcely an interval between its ominous crashing discharges. In some such manner came on that battle of May 2nd. Major General Oliver Otis Howard, Commander 11th Corps, Army of the Potomac. Hey everyone, welcome to the 265th episode of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. As y'all recall, by the end of the last episode, it was the evening of Saturday, May 2nd, 1863, and Stonewall Jackson's famous flank march at the Battle of Chancellorsville was over, and the Confederate juggernaut was just about to sweep out of the woods and into the Union Army's exposed right flank. Yep. In his book, Chancellorsville, 1863, The Souls of the Brave, Ernest B. Ferguson writes, Jackson had studied and prayed for what lay before him. Every professional soldier, from cadet to commander, dreams of bringing his troops to the line of departure against an unsuspecting enemy, with the battle and perhaps the war in the balance. Few, however long their careers, get there. Jackson knew that, and meant to make the most of the chance by thoroughly preparing his assault. But time was against him. He had started late. Then he had added more than two miles and two hours when he found out the Union line extended farther west than he expected. The hour grew late. The sun would set at 648, and darkness would fall swiftly in the thick woods. To spread battle lines through these woods was a tedious process. Any general in his place would be tempted to throw his forward troops into the attack immediately. But Jackson, having risked much, now risked more. He would roll up Howard's flank, but that was not enough. He could rout Hooker's army, hurl him into the river. He wanted to destroy it. This day's work could decide the war. Ferguson continues, writing, Jackson had reached not only Hooker's flank, but his rear, the unprotected span between the turnpike and the Rapidan. If Jackson were willing to advance on a narrow front along the turnpike, he could get his assault underway quickly. But in that case, once he penetrated far enough, the depth of Hooker's force would allow the Yankee brigades beyond the flank to sag in on the sides of Jackson's spearhead and possibly surround his lead units. To make sure that did not happen, Jackson would sacrifice more time. 
he would go at Hooker on such a broad front that whenever his troops hit a strong point, they would flow around and envelop it. And so Jackson used precious time to form three lines of battle, extending a mile north and a mile south into the woods on each side of the Orange Turnpike. Robert Rhodes' division would form the first line. Raleigh Colston's division came next, about a hundred or two hundred yards behind. Then backing up Colston were the lead units of A.P. Hill's still arriving division. From left to right, the brigades in Rhodes' front line were Iverson's North Carolinians and O'Neill's Alabamians north of the turnpike, and then south of the road were the Georgians of Dole's and Colquitt's brigades. Colston's second line had Nichols' Louisianans on the left, then John R. Jones' Virginians, and then Warren's mixed Virginia-North Carolina brigade. Ramser's North Carolina troops dropped back from Rhodes' front line on the right to cover that flank of the advance. A.P. Hill's third line started to form with Heath's Virginians and Dorsey Pender's North Carolinians both north of the turnpike. Of Hill's other brigades, Lane was still arriving and McGowan was farther back. And it was only about this time that Stonewall Jackson found out that the brigades of Archer and Thomas had turned around to help fight off the Federals at Catherine Furnace, and so they were now barely halfway along the march route. That meant that by 515, ten of Jackson's fifteen brigades had arrived in time to deploy in three assault waves. As the regiments sifted through the woods to get into position north and south of the turnpike, With the men crouching and twisting between the trees and through the underbrush, they didn't need orders to be quiet. They knew how close they were to the enemy, and some of the enemy knew, too. Lieutenant A.B. Searles of the 45th New York was in the woods on the Federal picket line, when he, quote, began to hear a queer jumble of sounds, a confusion of orders, end quote. An alarmed Searles sent a sergeant to warn the regiment's colonel about, quote, an immense mass of men on our flank. Searles got no response, so he sent other soldiers back with the same message. But the commander of the division holding the right end of Howard's 11th Corps line, Brigadier General Charles Devens, loathed many of his subordinates, who were primarily of German descent, and so he instantly dismissed each warning that a large number of rebels were gathering just off to the west. Finally, the Massachusetts general, who had mixed his prejudices with alcohol, threatened to publicly denounce the Germans as cowards. In the face of Devon's obstinacy, someone decided to go over his head and take the warning directly to Corps headquarters. Depending on which account you consult, the bearer of the warning was either laughed at and denied access to Howard, or Howard heard them out, but assured them they must be mistaken, since he had it on the authority of General Hooker himself, that Lee was retreating, and Hooker intended to follow in pursuit the next morning. And so it was that Howard's 11th Corps, on Hooker's exposed right flank, was largely unprepared for the storm that was about to break upon it. At 5.15, most Union soldiers were settling down to cook dinner with their arms stacked when Stonewall Jackson turned to Robert Rhodes and asked if he was ready. Rhodes answered that he was, and Jackson quietly said, You may go forward then. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? 
Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. As bugles sounded the advance up and down the Confederate line of battle, 20,000 rebel soldiers started forward, crashing through the trees and underbrush across a two-mile front. As they moved forward, they scared up the wildlife of the wilderness, driving the frightened animals before them. Startled rabbits, quail, turkeys, deer, even a fox here and there, came bounding out of the woods and into the Federal lines, where most of the Union soldiers had just been settling down to cook their evening meal. Some of the men hooped and hollered, delighted at the unexpected sight. But then, hard on the heels of the terrified woodland creatures, came a seemingly unending line of hard-charging rebel soldiers. As the rebel yell erupted from thousands of Confederate throats, the long roll started to sound in the Federal camps, and Union soldiers scrambled to grab their muskets and hastily form into line. Colonel Leopold von Gilsa commanded the brigade guarding Howard's far right. While the rest of the 11th Corps line was arraying facing south, von Gilsa had used a couple of regiments, the 54th New York and 153rd Pennsylvania, to refuse his line or bend it back at a right angle, so those two regiments faced west down the turnpike. That meant von Gilsa had a roughly 200-yard front to challenge a two-mile-long line of Confederates. The hurriedly formed-up Federal soldiers here fired raggedly into Dole's brigade of Georgians. Two cannon on the turnpike added their deep voice to the pandemonium. Both Colonel Philip Cook of the 4th Georgia and Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Hobson of the 5th Alabama fell severely wounded in the opening minutes of the attack. Von Gilsa realized he was on the verge of being overwhelmed, so he galloped directly to Corps headquarters and demanded immediate reinforcement. Howard reportedly answered, With the help of God, you have to keep this position. Von Gilsa shot back, To the devil with such talk, of what avail is God's help only? I must have soldiers. Meanwhile, most of the Confederates continued unabated into the Union rear. The rebel attack quickly unhinged Howard's right and started to roll up Devon's divisional line, which was aligned along the turnpike, facing south, when the unexpected storm broke upon it from out of the west. Jackson was on us, said one Federal soldier, and fear was on us. One North Carolina officer recalled, quote, They did run and make no mistake about it, but I will never blame them. I would have done the same thing, and so would you, and I reckon the devil himself would have run, with Jackson in his rear. Individual regiments in Devon's line attempted to turn and face the onslaught, 
but their formations were quickly broken up by the crowds of fleeing Union soldiers from units whose positions had already been overrun. Stonewall Jackson's plan was working. His extended line simply flowed around and engulfed any Federals who attempted to make a stand. Devens received a slight wound in the foot and rapidly left the field. His replacement, Brigadier General Nathaniel McLean, also fell wounded. Leaderless and overwhelmed, the division collapsed, and the 11th Corps' right flank was broken wide open. Word had been passed along our line for the boys to eat supper and make ourselves comfortable. Our band was playing in the pine grove to our rear, when like a crash of thunder from the clear sky, there came a volley of musketry from the right. As I looked down the road, I could see the German officers trying to rally the men as everything seemed to be giving way. Just then a couple of deer came out of the woods to our right, and Sergeant Major Lowe says, See those deer? as a bullet struck the top of his cap and scorched his head. I then saw the Rebs as they were coming out of the timber. A rebel battery had opened up in the road and began sending grape up the road by the hatful. I remember so well seeing a rebel color bearer as he jumped over the fence waving his flag. We stopped the Rebs in our front for a moment, but there was a perfect hailstorm of lead flying, a perfect mass of rebs not twenty feet away. The man on my right and left both fell. Our right being overlapped, crumbled away. The rebs surged ahead, and I ran toward our left flank, and how I did run. Sergeant Luther B. Messnerd, 55th Ohio Infantry, McLean's Brigade. We all then sprang forwards with such a shout and yell, mingled with a full round of mini balls, that they gave away at the first onset of our boys. Thus their first works were carried, and when we once got them going, we pressed them back over and farther and farther, until they got up a perfect stampede, leaving behind in our hands everything that was cumbrous, such as knapsacks, blankets, hats, shoes, and overcoats all sorts of clothing, and all their little things too tedious to mention, besides a large lot of fine small arms and several pieces of artillery with quite a number of fine horses, as well as all of their killed and wounded. Captain William B. Haygood, 44th Georgia Infantry, Dole's Brigade. At this time, our arms were stacked in the road, the boys still playing draw poker, but when they heard the whistle of bullets, concluded not to play longer. That was the situation our brigade was in when the bullets began whistling over our heads along the flank. No one ever saw men hustle on their traps and get into line any quicker than we did. By the time we had gotten into line and taken arms, they had crowded us so much from the right as to turn me right about. By this time, the right had been driven back pell-mell. In fact, the whole line was broken. It would not have been good generalship on my part to have stopped and made a close examination, so I followed the rest. As we emerged from the woods into an open field, I saw a sight I shall never forget as long as I live. There were regiments, brigades, and divisions completely disorganized and scattered. In the midst was General Howard and staff, or part of it. On the extreme right of that scattered line was a small body of men, which I afterward learned was McLean's brigade of the 1st Division, making a desperate attempt to check the advance of the enemy. I saw General Howard swinging his revolver in his hand. He had no right hand. And when I had gotten close to him, he was crying out, Halt! Halt! I'm ruined, I'm ruined. I'll shoot if you don't stop. I'm ruined, I'm ruined. Over and over again. I stopped, leaned on my musket, and looked at him in surprise and wonder that a man who occupied the position he did should get so completely confused and bewildered. In fact, he was rattled. 
Sergeant James H. Peabody, 61st Ohio, Schimmelfenning's Brigade. In Stephen Sears' book on Chancellorsville, he writes, Like rushing waters from a burst dam, Jackson's massive assault came boiling out of the woods into the next open ground to the east along the turnpike. This was the large, irregularly shaped clearing surrounding Wilderness Church and the intersection of the Plank Road and the turnpike. The Baptist Chapel, a modest white painted frame building, was set back 150 yards from the road in a little grove. Beyond it, a quarter mile farther to the north, was the Hawkins Farmstead. To the east, close by the Plank Road, was Dowdall's Tavern, headquarters of the 11th Corps. Carl Schertz's division held this area around Wilderness Church, supported on the east by the last of the Corps' units then in line, Adolphus Bushbeck's brigade of von Steinwehr's division. Beyond Bushbeck, there were no federal troops anywhere in sight for more than a mile. That's because Sickles had relocated the bulk of his Third Corps to the south for his sparring match at Catherine Furnace, and Hooker had fed reinforcements into Sickles' movement, so that a dangerous gap now existed between the Eleventh Corps and the rest of the army. In short, there was now no one nearby to back up the rapidly collapsing 11th Corps. The Confederates, therefore, had plenty of room to simply keep pushing Howard's men. Howard had returned to his headquarters just a short time before, after leading Barlow's brigade to join Sickles at Catherine Furnace, and now fugitives from Devon's shattered division rushed headlong past and through Schertz's troops, spreading panic like an infection. The sight stunned Howard, who wrote to his wife, saying that Devon's men, quote, broke up and ran upon the other troops with such momentum that they gave way too. Such a mass of fugitives I haven't seen since the first battle at Bull Run. Schertz's division was called the most foreign in the Army of the Potomac since eight of its ten regiments were German. The brigade commanders were Alexander Schimmelfenig and Vladimir Krizanowski. Four of the regiments had never seen combat before. Although Schertz had earlier shown foresight in facing three of his regiments to the west on the Hawkins farm, that precaution proved only enough to delay the Confederate juggernaut for a matter of minutes. At the farm, the 82nd Ohio, 58th New York, and 26th Wisconsin, which was one of the new regiments, traded volleys with the rebels until they were outflanked and forced to fall back. They did so in good order, but to the south, between Wilderness Church and the Plank Road, the scene was utter chaos. Federal officers trying to pivot their regiments to meet the enemy attack had neither the time nor space to do so. For example, here in their first battle, the Germans of the 119th New York saw nine of the twelve men in their color guard shot down. Their colonel was Elias Peisner, who was reported to be the illeg- illegitimate son of the King of Bavaria. Peisner was hit by two bullets and killed, and the regimental line collapsed. The strongest federal showing on this wilderness church line was made by a veteran German artillery officer, Captain Hubert Dilger, and his battery I, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Dilger, nicknamed Leather Breeches, placed his half-dozen 12-pounder Napoleons on a little rise near the Plank Road and opened an effective fire on Stonewall's legions as they broke into the clearing. The Confederate infantry stretched beyond sight left and right, but Dilger held off the rebels to his front giving them double loads of canister until the enemy advanced to within a hundred yards of his position. Then Leather Breeches had his guns pull back and do it again. Finally, he sent all but one of his cannon to the rear, and that one piece he used to try and hold back the rebels and keep the plank road open. 
Otis Howard and his staff officers had rushed into the stream of fugitives to try, as he put it, to arrest the tide. Howard took up a flag and gripped the staff with the stump of his right arm, hoping by example to inspire a rally, but the fleeing troops paid little attention to him. A correspondent for the New York Herald, Thomas Cook, was watching the rout. He wrote, On the one hand was a solid column of infantry retreating at double quick from the face of the enemy. On the other was a dense mass of beings who had lost their reasoning faculties and were flying from a thousand fancied dangers. Battery wagons, ambulances, horses, men, cannon, caissons, all jumbled and tumbled together in an apparently inextricable mass, and that murderous fire still pouring in upon them. Stonewall Jackson's men were thrilled. They had seen the Yankees retreat before, but never was it like this. In a letter to his brother, a soldier in the 21st Virginia declared, quote, You never saw such a grand sight in your life. We came up in rear of the Yankees late in Saturday evening. You never saw such a charge as we made upon them. We soon got them routed, and then it was a perfect foot race. A North Carolinian said how, quote, The thick woods through which we were passing was like a strainer, letting the lean and lesser Dutchmen escape while we secured the fat ones. Stonewall Jackson rode close behind his attacking troops, following the pursuit along the Orange Turnpike. As the rebel soldiers surged around him, his eyes flared, and he urged them again and again, Forward, men! Forward! But by now, Rhodes' division was disorganized by the stretches of woodland in its path and by the knots of resistance it met. Colonels and captains took over direction of the assault when it outdistanced higher commands. Raleigh Colston's division closed up on roads, and in many places the two lines became jumbled together, causing greater disarray in the Confederate flanks. A.P. Hill's third line to the rear was still coming up and seldom came near to the enemy. The rebel soldiers hadn't been issued rations in 48 hours, and so many Confederate accounts of the attack speak of the welcome Yankee beef found still simmering over campfires. As Alfred Iverson put it in his report, quote, Hungry men seized provisions as they passed the camps of the enemy and rushed forward, eating, shouting, and firing. Howard attempted his last stand with the last of his force, the brigade of Adolphus Bushbeck. The brigade took position in some rifle pits near Dowdall's Tavern that had been dug earlier facing west. Some of the more stout-hearted of Devon's and Schertz's troops rallied here and joined Bushbeck's men. Perhaps 4,000 Federals manned a line a thousand yards long here, but soon enough Rhodes' rebels outflanked them to the north, and in 20 minutes' time, Otis Howard's last line was turned. Stonewall Jackson was still riding close behind his swiftly advancing troops. To every officer he encountered, Jackson would bark, Press forward! Press forward! By the account of Jackson's signal officer, Captain Robert Wilborn, quote, All the orders I heard him give were simply a repetition of this order. Wilborn wrote, He was in unusually fine spirits, and every time he heard the cheering of ourselves, which was the signal of victory, he raised his right hand a few seconds, as if in acknowledgment of the blessing, and to return thanks to God for the victory. Old Jack might well give thanks. In just an hour and a half, his surprise attack had flanked and overwhelmed the enemy 11th Corps and driven it a mile and a quarter and routed it from its last feasible defensive position. From Dowdall's Tavern, it was less than two miles to the Chancellor House and the heart of Hooker's position. But by now the sun was down, and perhaps just 40 minutes of evening twilight remained. And so just then... As rebel artillerist Porter Alexander put it, daylight was worth a million dollars a minute to the fortunes of the Confederacy. (laughs) 
That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. But we don't have a book recommendation for you. Instead, we have a special announcement that we're very excited about. We're going to be making a trip to Gettysburg this June. Yep, uh, we're going to be heading back east from Colorado this summer to visit family, and we'll also be swinging by Gettysburg. We've been talking about really wanting to get back to Gettysburg this year before we start to cover the campaign and battle on the podcast, and so, well, we'll be there in June. And we'd love to actually meet up with some of y'all while we're there. So in the next week or so, we'll have a date in June to share with you in case you want to plan ahead to meet two of your favorite podcasters in person. Yeah, but if they can't make it, then you'll have to settle for us. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, that'll give all of us something to look forward to. Uh, For right now, though, thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War. 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us again next time when we'll continue with the story of the Battle of Chancellorsville. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.